Hi, and welcome. Um, I'm Michael Knapp, and um, I put together a small panel on the building Internet of Things. Um, the building Internet of Things um, is, I think, in a nutshell, I, I think of it anyway as um, objects joining people and um, joining computers on the Internet that we've all been creating for the past couple of decades. Um, and we're going to bring um, a perspective from the IT industry. Uh, the three of us, Vladi Shantarov, Ulrich Scharf, and I, um, come from three different companies, um, all focusing uh, in very different ways on applications of Internet of Things, and in particular, building Internet of Things uh, technology. Um, my company is a custom software development company. We've built a platform for GRESB. Um, among other other software um, environments, and um, uh, Gres uh, does the reporting to investors on portfolios, and Ulrich will tell you a little more about that. But uh, using data feeds that come up from a company uh, like Vladi's, like Lucid, um, so um, Vladi's company takes about a billion and a half square feet of data, automated data, feeds it up brings it to building managers and many other stakeholders. Um, that data will feed on to um, a company like Grez to present to investors. Um, and then what I'm going to do in, in uh, my presentation um, will be to look at, OK, here we are now. Where do we go from here? So really to take a look at some of the advances in machine learning and recommendation systems and how we're going to use that in the building Internet of Things. Um, so the format is going to be about 15 minutes uh, from each of us, um, and then we'll open it up for a discussion and questions and so on. Um, so, Vladi. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. So obviously, we're all really passionate about buildings. That's my personal passion is buildings. Um, and buildings have uh, gone through a lot of evolution over history, and we're going to go through a little bit of, uh, about that today. Uh, but we're sort of sitting at the juncture now where uh, digital software technology and data specifically are really beginning to transform how we design, how we build, and most importantly, how we actually operate commercial buildings. Um, and so as uh, Michael mentioned, our company Lucid um, works with large portfolio building owners and operators, uh, both government, education, uh, corporate, and also commercial real estate that are multi-tenant. So we get to see all facets of uh, people that have all kinds of different challenges of how do you manage buildings over time uh, and do so efficiently, not, so, not only from a utility perspective, but also from a purely operations perspective as far as human resources. And so buildings, I think, to all of us here matter in a very big way. Um, you've seen these stats before. We spend 90% of our lives in buildings uh, within the built environment. Uh, buildings are responsible for two-thirds of all electrical energy and surpass transportation as the number one user of all energy. Um, and if you look at the building that made me fall in love with buildings, this is the Lewis Center uh, for Environmental Studies in Ohio. This is a William McDonough building. Uh, really one of the very first modern green buildings built in the U.S., voted as the most important building of the 20th century by Time Magazine, uh, long before the LEED standard was uh, conceived of. Um, this was a very complex structure. It represented a net zero goal, uh, which finally has been accomplished. Um, and it had a lot of different systems. Um, and none of them really quite worked the way they were supposed to until we had data to optimize them. And so to make this kind of building work, um, we needed data. Um, and so the story today is really about connected technology and how it enables data um, over time. Uh, this building was a big challenge for a college campus to manage. Uh, people on campus weren't equipped. They didn't have the tools. They didn't have the know-how. They didn't have the business process to manage so many complex systems in one structure, let alone how that scales across a campus. And so if you want to look at the evolution of technology, there's been a lot of so-called disruptive technology in the history of buildings. Uh, so those are innovations that transform the industry, transform businesses and opportunities and how we uh, think about commercial real estate. Uh, the first most notable innovation is the invention of the safety mechanism in the elevator, because prior to that, uh, buildings only used to go five stories high because the elevators weren't, uh, weren't safe. They would fall down in the shaft every once in a while, and five stories seemed like a good number of stories to fall from. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so when Otis came up with a safety mechanism, um, it completely transformed buildings. We went vertical. We went 10 stories, 20 stories, and higher. We had to change materials. You couldn't use brick and stone anymore. You had to go to steel. 
Um, so it changed everything about building construction. It was just this one simple invention, the safety mechanism of the elevator. And Otis, without a doubt, put their mark on tall buildings in the world uh, over time. And so for the first time, if you want to look at the evolution of buildings, uh, buildings for the very first time got their spine. They could stand up and go high. And so with that became the need to heat them appropriately. So Warren Johnson uh, invented the thermostat out of an act of frustration because he was a teacher in Milwaukee that was constantly being interrupted by the boiler room operator checking if the classroom is comfortable and adjusting the boiler. So he came up with a mechanical device and then went on to start Jones Controls um, afterwards uh, and really marked the beginning of building automation as we know it today. Um, and so for the first time in 1886, buildings got uh, their temperature taken, they got their pulse. We could really feel how, they, uh, how people are feeling inside of a building and adjust the systems. And then cooling became an issue because as buildings got bigger and the surface to volume uh, ratio changed, uh, Willis Carrier came up with a way to get um, warm, moist air run through a bunch of water droplets and uh, reduce the temperature and extract the, the humidity. And so modern air conditioning was born and now we can actually have comfortable environments, uh, one of which we are in today. Um, and so buildings were able to get respiratory system and lungs. And then people wanted to control stuff, obviously. They wanted stuff to, one tenant would, uh, wanted one set of temperature set points, another tenant wanted another. And so digital controls were born. Uh, we were actually able to um, actuate and change settings across those systems. Um, and then we had sort of this nervous fiber, fibrous tissue that started forming, uh, but it wasn't, it was far from intelligent. It was sort of, we could send a signal and people had to signal, send the signal from the same building. And then came the internet, so people got used to sending signals across buildings and across campuses, and so these systems had to somehow start to talk across a network of devices, local networks in the beginning. And so these systems started to have a voice on the local uh, campus environment, um, and they were represented by different vendors. So every vendor had its own set of sort of languages uh, with uh, which they could communicate with those systems. And over time, that became a problem because you couldn't get systems to talk to each other. And so protocols like BACnet and Modbus, um, which were developed in the early 90s, came about to create that common language between systems. Uh, much of building automation technology still runs on these protocols today. Um, they're not really adequate to continue supporting the kind of innovation we want to see. So that's a separate topic. Um, uh, that we should dig in a, into s at some point, but that's how systems got to talk together and it changed things because you got interoperability. And so you got all these languages that buildings can communicate with back and forth and systems can connect. And that made sense when all you were doing is doing HVAC controls, but as building technology evolved and we now have on-site generation, you have storage, uh, you have light, lighting controls and lighting management, you have smart security systems, you have indoor air quality monitoring, uh, you have plug load management, the list of systems goes on. Um, these things weren't really designed for the BACnet protocol, so all these companies are building their own APIs, there's no standardization, and so there's a real challenge of how do you actually get data to flow between these systems, because you can't have an intelligent building if everything kind of does its own thing in vacuum. That was a challenge we had at the Lewis Center, is the systems weren't really speaking with each other and we were ending up with massive inefficiencies in how we were operating the building as a result. And so we now have this fibrous network of sensors and actuators. There's a lot of capability, but nothing quite connects the dots. And, and sort of after the work we were doing at the Lewis Center, that became our mission is how do you connect the dots across all these disparate systems, get the data in the cloud in a way that you can um, apply software innovation. And software innovation that we've seen in kind of other uh, verticals of the economy really change uh, markets uh, completely. And another challenge that we faced uh, in this industry was that the software that came with building technology is really hard to use. It's really complex, super technical. Uh, the engineers know how to use it, they're really trained, but all the other building owners, operators, occupants, tenants, et cetera, finance people, sustainability practitioners, completely inaccessible to them. We couldn't access the systems in the Lewis Center we, as research students, so we were pretty technical. We couldn't figure it out. So we had to build augmented systems to get data out of the building. Um, and so we really focus on connecting the dots, making data easy, data access easy, get it in the cloud, and then enable it for things that we frankly don't do very well today. Resource efficiency management, operations of the building, sustainability management, engaging your tenants, uh, being able to work um, with compliance and reporting and automate the kinds of things that Gresb does really well. Um, but all this depends on data, and data has to be simple. And that's what really takes you to a truly intelligent building. If you can connect the dots between a leasing system and a building automation system and enable that, 
abstraction, then you can actually have a shot of having a truly intelligent campus. Um, and for the first time, we're now getting to um, software innovation really enabling intelligent things in the building getting a brain for the first time. Uh, because, and we're building on, again, decades and decades of technology innovation, uh, right? We're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants as we do that. Um, if you look at data, building generate a tremendous amount of data. There's so much of it. In fact, if you think you don't have data on your building, you're probably wrong because the utility has it, there's smart meters, there's building systems, you may just not be capturing it. Um, the challenge is that most of it is sitting there and not being captured, and also, it's largely analog. A lot of these systems are in the basement, they're not connected, they weren't designed to be connected to the internet because we have a lot of legacy building stock. We don't operate, this is a, the older building stock market compared to, let's say, uh, greater China region where there's a lot of new modern buildings. And so that's where we sit as an industry. Um, we're sort of at this tipping point of what will be probably one of the very last major uh, transitions of analog to digital uh, across any market. Um, and there's a lot of companies working to enable that. Uh, for the building owner, we're still very much manual. Most building owners struggle with manual workflows. They struggle with getting manual data. Um, this is what our customers end up having to do before they start working with us, is this is the job of the facility managers to punch, in, punch this into Excel um, every single month. That's just not time utilization done well. Uh, you should be doing other things as a facility manager. And if you look across the board, data enables not just the energy and, and, and the engineer uh, uh, crew of the building, um, it enables facility operators. It enables sustainability practitioners. It's really challenging to meet sustainability goals if you don't know what the metrics are and if you can't create a culture of transparency and accountability, and that requires data and metrics. Uh, if you're a finance person, you've got a finance efficiency project, it's really difficult to do that. Again, if you don't have hard data on which projects are giving you a financial return, not a kilowatt hour return, a financial return in which projects aren't. That needs to be simple. Today that's very hard. Um, and ultimately, it goes down to the building order and the set of investors, which is why what Eurek's gonna talk about is so relevant to us today, because investor, uh, investor initiatives are what really pushes change. That's why people end up investing in these strategies, in these various technologies that you've been checking out all day at the Expo Hall today. And so building, um, data-driven building management is a cultural shift that organizations are, have already started embarking on. Some have done a lot, some are just getting started, but everyone is focused on it. We're seeing the hiring of the very first data analysts and data administrators and building operations teams. And that's, that's a telltale sign that this matters and people see data as a critical business asset and how they operate the built environment around them. Um, the key is that you gotta keep it simple. Buildings are very, very complex systems. We all know that. They're complex to design, they're really complex to build, they're even harder to operate once they're built because you need all the knowledge of what went into the design and the construction to operate it well. Uh, and conditions are changing and the macroeconomics of building operations are changing and tenants have certain needs. And so if you don't take the view that matters to a single person and create something actionable where you can give them a simple view of what matters so they can take an action, then you will probably fail at using data to impact change. And data by itself doesn't actually make any business process flow any better, um, unless you have adoption. And that's when we say internet of everything, everything means people. So you gotta get the technology connected all the way down to the person that makes the individual decision. And in other industries, like um, vehicles, I like the Tesla example because they have a $60,000 asset and they're monitoring everything about it. The engine, the speed, the braking, the behavior of the driver, the surrounding objects, and that data is being sampled every single second of being sent to the cloud. And then you look at our industry, and you look at buildings that are between 100 to 1,000 times more valuable, we have no idea how they perform after we build them. We have no idea how they perform after we construct the building. We don't even know how they perform when we own the building and we're responsible for the operation. And that's the journey that organizations are beginning to embark on is saying data matters, we have to know how we do, we have to know whether this building is functioning well or not, and we should decide how to invest capital. Do we do improvements? Do we actually allocate different building stock? So data is pretty key to uh, any owner and operator now, and that's, that's the shift that we are seeing. I wanna give some actual practical examples because it's easy to talk about data in an abstract sense, but I wanna make sure you guys walk away with specifics. Um, this is an example of uh, 15 minute interval data, smart meter data or submetering data that's coming from a, a submeter, a building automation system or a smart meter from the utility. And it tells you a, a picture of when the building starts up, when it shuts down, uh, what does the weekend scheduling look like, did I do an override that ended up uh, drifting through the night and no one cared to set it back. Um, those are the kinds of operational inefficiencies that on average, if you keep them in check 
you can cut billing energy use by 17%, and that's a very large number. Um, and that's what customers are seeing. If you actually manage the building efficiently, you can reduce energy spend by 17% if you have that data. And it's pretty easy and very low cost to get uh, these kind of data these days. When you look at a whole campus, it's hard to manage hundreds of assets, sometimes thousands of assets, uh, proactively because you don't have the hours in the day to look at information like this. So you really want machine learning and software intelligence to do the heavy lifting for you and tell you this building's base load just went up and your annual impact is 9,000 bucks. Maybe that matters to you, maybe it doesn't. That's for you to decide. Uh, but this information is pushed to you and you can then make a decision if you want to act on it or not. Uh, in a similar way, we've seen inefficiencies that would almost double the gas use of a building from a simple override that nowhere, nowhere reversed in the BMS system. Again, it's human operator behavior uh, that you want to you want to tackle because we can't design technology for everything. You have to also account for the human operator as well. And so, if you look at the spectrum of information across the board, there's a lot of different data sets. There's um, indoor air quality, which matters. Buildings at the end of the day have to uh, provide shelter. They have to provide a comfortable, productive, healthy environment for us to do what we do all day long. Um, you need utility data from the utilities. You have uh, leasing data on your tenants. You have work order data. Um, you want to know if you're a commercial real estate owner um, whether your vacancies are tied to the economy, uh, whether they're tied to a specific geography. Maybe you have someone who's not responding to your work order, so you have really crappy management in a specific building that you really got to take a look at and replace. Maybe the building is really inefficient. Maybe people are not comfortable in the building. Maybe there's a lot of BLCs that's making people sick. It's really hard to answer those business questions without data. And the data is not just about the data itself, but it also has to be um, business grade data, data that you can count on from a data quality perspective and also uh, to make both investment decisions and operational decisions. Um, and that's a gap that has, we've had a lot of infrastructure in this market. Um, the gap that we are filling in as a company and we're focused on is filling that software intelligence, data intelligence piece so you can have business grade data to make solid operational and investment decisions on. And so what I'm really excited about is um, the rate at which the market is adopting this kind of technology. So we've been doing this, I've been doing this for uh, well over a decade now since we started the company. Um, and it's, uh, it hasn't been the, the fastest uh, uh, adoption of technology in this market. We all know that it, it takes a while to convince people why they should change how they run their business. Um, but things are speeding up really fast. Uh, just in the last 12 months, we've added over 10,000 buildings on our platform, and we're now sitting on um, about one and a half billion square feet of space. Commercial space is being actively monitored in all kinds of different ways. And some customers collect a little bit of data, some customers collect a lot of data. And so um, with that, I want to um, introduce um, Yurik with, with Gresp. And, and we're excited to make actually an announcement uh, today, which is that our companies have decided to uh, come together and collaborate on uh, getting the data that we worked so hard to actually unlock and make a business grade uh, for multiple users and actually equip investors of commercial real estate assets to be able to very quickly analyze uh, the makeup of commercial portfolios uh, and the risk factor of commercial portfolios and the sustainability uh, class of different commercial portfolios. And so Eurek would be able to talk to you guys about um, sort of the IT perspective, the machine learning perspective, and the analytics perspective of uh, what kind of data do investors care about? Because that impacts all of us. That impacts what kinds of projects they're gonna invest in, which assets will be bought and sold. Um, at the end of the day, um, it, it plugs into everything that we do as sustainability practitioners in this space. So, um, Yurik, really excited to work with you guys and would love to hear more about sort of the investment side of the equation um, and how investors are using data from an analytics side point. Yeah, thank you very much. Yep. So this is a uh, fantastic introduction, not only to this, uh, talk, but also you know, really to the importance of flowing data upwards to investors. And in this context, I'm going to take it a little bit more to a level of abstraction. And you will have all seen this photo. It represents the first internationally legally binding agreement between nations to really cut carbon emissions. And that's a clear signal to the world. It's a clear signal that countries will use legislation, they will use regulation in order to achieve these goals. And you know, that would be preaching to the choir to further talk about this. But an interesting side aspect of this is that it's now also really driven by investors. So for example, 130 investors uh, wrote to the G20, basically demanding that this issue is pushed forward. And 
you know, that is a lot of change. 130 as a number, that might sound very little, but the capital that that actually represents is staggering. And the impact these investment uh, funds and financial markets are gonna have is very profound on the build environment. So this is obviously going on since a while, but there's now really an accelerated and increased movement in this. So capital increasingly flows down the food chain, basically from capital markets to property companies, to portfolios, and essentially into buildings with A, a clear desire to understand the sustainability performance of buildings, but also increasingly demanding clear improvements and the ability to, tr to track and show improvements. And with this mandate, commitment flows up. Property, uh, property managers, facility managers, now increasingly need to report and commit to portfolio managers, who again to investment managers, who again to provide a financial markets report. Uh, they need to commit to you know, an accountability of the sustainability performance of buildings. And that dynamic is essentially causing you know, a lot of positive work really on the level of the building. GRESP as an organization creates analytical tools on the company and portfolio level. So we provide investors with the opportunity to understand these portfolios and what actually sits in them with the buildings. So you might ask the question, why do investors really care about it? It's not really the desire to improve this planet or to save it. Um, as always, it's mostly driven by economics. So I'm an economist myself, and you know, that's the part that makes me really excited. But today I'm gonna to focus on the one key driver. There are many reasons why investors find this interesting, but the main reason why they right now approach this so aggressively is essentially fear of regulation. Uh, I mentioned the Paris Agreement. Again, that's a very clear signal that regulation will come. And with regulation, energy, minimum energy efficiency standards will be imposed to markets. LEED and other certification schemes around the world have created really an outstanding job into defining what is a green building and also in a validated way certifying this. But, well, that shows only the fraction of the portfolio that's green. You know, that's essentially the part we don't need to worry about if I'm focused on regulation. What investors want to understand is as regulation increases, which part of their portfolio is really exposed to this. And that requires, again, the clear understanding on what is under this curve. So what is the, if you want, so the gray area, not just the green area at the top, but really the gray area of the portfolio, and to clearly understand, okay, what is the current condition of all of these buildings and portfolios and what is happening on the ground to improve this? Now this curve looks very simple here, but it represents an enormous scale of money. So Apple nowadays is the most valuable uh, company in the world and probably in the history of the world. Uh, I just looked up, it's now 620 billion, but right now, um, but this represents a ridiculous amount of money again. It's hard to fathom or imagine what 580 billion US dollars are, but this is essentially dwarfed by the current investment of institutional investors into commercial real estate. We're talking about 7.6 trillion US dollars, which want to be understood, and that want to have the data that allows them to understand the performance of these buildings. GRESP is very proud to cover 2.8 trillion of this amount of money. So our job, at the end of the day is to be able to get the data, to validate the data, and to benchmark the data for 2.8 trillion US dollars in real estate. And for investors, this is important because it allows them to you know, really understand what happens in this part of their portfolios and investments and allows to competitively differentiate between different portfolios, to engage with portfolios, and to set also clear targets on improvements. The rest, outside of these 2.8 trillion US dollars, mostly represent risk and uncertainty. It doesn't mean that they're less green, but it certainly means that we just right now don't really know how good they are. So our task again is to aggregate for 2.8 trillion US dollars information and data, and not only do that in a, let's say, very confined arena, do it globally. You see here right now the kind of our coverage in different regions. And all of these regions come with very unique kind of problems and context. 
and also different data formats. So our role at this point in time is to have a model that covers the scale and really allows to understand the scale of information. And this is now the point where I basically take it from the level of abstraction down again to the building level. So if I would impose you know, the challenge to us, what we essentially need to do is build a system for 55 institutional investors that currently use our data that covers 760 property companies and portfolios um, and analyze those. So far, again, the numbers look relatively little. However, this represents approximately 66,000 assets. And this excludes residential or smaller single units. These are all massive buildings. And just Fadi explained how difficult it is to understand each one of these buildings as itself. So we somehow need to tap into the source of data for the scale. And that's, again, for me, very hard to grasp how many different data points, sources, meters, air quality, sensors, et cetera, we're talking about. And this data exists in many different formats. We want to understand the environmental performance of buildings. So what is the energy efficiency, um, consumption, water, GHG, waste, so basically the footprint of a building. We also want to understand what is the geospatial information we have about this building. Where is it allocated? And increasingly, there is an interest in how is it affected by global warming. So how will rising sea levels affect this building? And as a hot topic, I think pretty much since around one or two years, we see really this emergence of indoor air quality, health, and well-being. And you know, topics that center more around the human within the building. So this is the spectrum of data sources we need. And the spectrum comes also with clear demands in the quality of the data. It needs to be investment grade. That's a concept we developed together with PwC, where we define a quality of data that allows to make investment decision on it. So again, this means that there should be pretty much no human involvement when this data is generated. It should be fully auditable. There should be a clear path of essentially the meter where the data was originally recorded to the financial metric that is used for decision making by investors. This also means that the data needs to be automized. So it needs to automatically flow again from a single meter or a single sensor in a very you know, automated fashion up to the highest level of abstraction, where it's merged together with thousands, ten thousands, hundreds of thousands of different data points. And the last part of this challenge is that there should be preferably no reduction of, uh, you know, no administration, administrative burden. So all of this kind of needs to happen for, you know, almost for free. Companies and portfolios that report to GRASP should not have to spend large resources in, able to, in order to create this data. So if you would have imposed to me this challenge and say, well, please build a system that does all of this on the scale, covers all of these different data sources, and fulfills these standards, I would say, well, that's flat out impossible. That really doesn't work. But now with the emergence of different data collection systems, as for example, Lucids and many great solutions around the world that cover different angles of building data, we suddenly have a point where we can connect to. So what we have been focusing on the last 24 months is to really create an ecosystem of data sources and connect all of them. So if you want so, Vladi's system allows to take data from the bottom, from the different meters, and somehow aggregate it up. And in that analogy, we are kind of reaching down from the top, so the highest level of abstraction. And this allows us to you know, really tap into different points of aggregation. So, so far, what we did in the past was we had some spatial information about a building. That's very simple. Normally, a building doesn't move. So once you solve that, you kind of you know, just can overlay it with flooding data and other information you have. Additionally, we uh, load data automatically from 70, 80 different certification and rating databases, as for example, Lead Online is one of them. Again, it's a fairly static thing. It doesn't change constantly. But when you talk about the data we want to have on performance of buildings, that's continuously changing. Basically, since I started this talk, 
again, so much data was generated by this building, and somehow this needs to feed up. And what we focus on in this ecosystem is to basically connect to all of these external data systems as Lucid. And Lucid's clients, so property owners and portfolios, they're basically our respondents. And they have building accounts in which they aggregate the data as in the photos we have seen in the presentation beforehand. And you know, suddenly we have a direct flow. We have this idea of a meter automatically generating data, and it flows through several stages in one seamless way and one audible way to financial markets. And that's a you know, very interesting development for us. So far we have around 25, 30 partners that you know, work with us on this data or stream us the data in different formats, and we're still currently seeing to expand this. But now I want to really address the point where is this, you know, where does this become very relevant again on the level of the building? I personally would argue that the data and the reporting itself certainly doesn't make these buildings greener. And I'm also very sure that GRESP itself doesn't make the real estate space greener. But what it creates is a form of accountability to, you know, a stakeholder that so far has not existed. It allows to, um, you know, creates a platform for people that do real things on the building level that manage buildings to show what they do and show their progress. And at the same time, there's somebody very, very powerful, even though on an abstracted level, that wants to see that data and that progress. And that you know, leverages work and allows to take something, and now we're gonna steal a quote from Michael, uh, take sustainability a little bit from the periphery of the organization more to its core. There's suddenly a different client for it. And yeah, with this, I, I have the kind of honor and privilege to introduce Michael, who has been working on uh, sustainability and different software systems that allow to understand it in many different fields for the last 15 years. And yeah, your objective always was to take something that especially 15 years ago was rather niche and separate, to take it to something that you know, really becomes core of the organization. And, you know, nobody can talk better about the learning points and what you experienced during that journey than you yourself. So, um, Thanks. may I hand it over? Thanks. Excellent. So we've learned a little bit about adding intelligence to buildings, as Vladi presented to us. Um, we've begun to understand that the building Internet of Things is more than um, automated data collection. It's more than freeing us up from the forms that we've all had to fill out too much of our life. Um, and that really it's about connecting from the meter um, right up through to the investor. Um, and what I need to do with you is kind of step back, step back even from our field um, in... Um, green building and say, okay, now that we have this ecosystem emerging, how are we gonna build an improvement system? How are we gonna make our planet more environmentally sound? How are we gonna make it more just, more ethical? How do we put social responsibility, or better yet, social justice into our invention? So for me, you know, you can almost think of it as a Disney movie, right? Any technology is used for good or evil. Um, the internet is part of that, and I think the internet of things is part of that. And I think we in the green building movement are sitting ahead of so many other fields, frankly, in an effort to really bring, you know, from these rating systems such as GRESB and LEED, we can really drive innovation, we can drive ecological sensitivity, we can drive um, social sensitivity into the built environment. And um, so how are we gonna do that? Especially as a technologist, as, a, as somebody in IT. Um, so step back with me for a second and say, okay, over the 15, 16 years at Green River, what the heck have we learned? So that then when we begin to look at what a, um, what a, you know, what a system that's, um, 
that's built off a of data science that's going to be a recommendation system that's going to be very directed at us, that's going to tell us what to do. How are we going to build it? So I want to take first a minute to look at the lessons that we've learned in green building and other fields, and then begin to think about what these systems will look like in the future if they're going to work. So I'm going to draw from lessons not just in green building, but also in agriculture, in public health, uh, and in our work in, in school improvement as well. Um, and these projects, they may or may not be investor oriented as Grez was. They may or may not have systems that inspectors or auditors go out and, and, and observe. Um, they may or may not have automated data feeds. They may or may not have complex scoring models. Um, they, all, they all are really about the non-financial metrics, right? The, the, the parts of our built environment, um, the parts of our uh, environment in general um, that, are, that are a little harder to measure. Um, and the best of these projects, I think, have a continuous improvement mechanism. And we'll look, we'll look at that. Um, a, a way of, of driving towards ever improving systems. Um, and the first lesson is obvious, I think, from Ulrich's presentation. Um, this is from work we did um, uh, under USAID funding with the Population Council, um, looking at prenatal outcomes uh, in, uh, in around the world, also population um, family planning. Um, and basically, it's that these systems do start with compliance. And I think the green building movement actually is a little bit unique in that, at least in the US, um, I feel like the movement came and was inspired in spite of, not because of. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I feel like the government regulation has not really driven our movement. And yet, um, in general, these improvement systems that we're thinking of um, require regulation. Um, the second lesson, um, which I think Vladi's presentation really drove, is that you can't lose people in a sea of data. You need to direct them towards what the information is and what they need to do. You need simplicity, not just these, these, these dashboards to, to, and, and fields of study. It's, it's about sort of a cookbook, which is very hard to do in system improvement. Um, this lesson is really counterintuitive, and it, it took me by surprise, frankly, and yet, in retrospect, probably pretty obvious. Um, Grassroots movements seem really important to all of us. Um, in IT, not, not, not so much. I mean, this is from a project uh, with the Teachers Union, the National Education Association, and Education in School Improvement. Um, Buy-in from the teachers, uh, interest from the teachers is crucial and important and valuable. But without district-level support, principals, districts, state, and federal, um, without leadership, IT projects fail. And so we're seeing that over and over again, that um, leadership in any organization needs to understand and value the systems we build. Another lesson from our work in supply chain certification with Starbucks is that our interfaces for these future systems have got to serve multiple constituencies. It can't just be one user base. And so with our Starbucks data, we, we started with inspecting farms and mills. Um, and yet, by building interfaces for agronomists who are responsible for coffee production into the data that's collected, for people responsible for purchasing the coffee, for people who are supplying the coffee, um, and so on, you begin to create that sort of periphery to core movement, that understanding that environment and social and governance metrics are, are important not just for inspection, for certification, but really are vital to the success of our business. Three more lessons for you. Um, one, obvious, use performance metrics. The, the, this is about the building Internet of Things. It's based on data. But the opposite lesson is probably harder for us to learn. Um, the data does not compel social change. It's the story. It's the narrative. It's, it's what, what people hear. It's about an individual at a farm in Panama, whose identity documents were taken away from them. They could not work somewhere else. Those identity documents were returned. It's not a zero tolerance failure. 
that, that we understand. It's the story of that individual. And so somehow our future systems need to capture not just the quantitative, but the qualitative, to be compelling, to be inspiring, to get us to do things differently. Um, and turning back to our certification, by making corporate social responsibility core to business success, that to me is the key. And, and here in the, in the image I'm showing you is on um, uh, taking corporate um, CSR data um, so, and presenting on disease spread, on yields, on pricing. And that's what Ulrich's talk was about, right? For me, the fact that a hotel chain swaps out its light bulbs for some that are more efficient or puts in an automated system to manage the lighting better. Yet, that's about climate change for me. But for the investor, it's probably about the fact that that hotel chain is better managed than the one that didn't bother, right? So we may have very different values, but they, they meet the alignment. And so for me, if we're gonna take what we care about and make it vital to capitalism in the future, it's gonna be by making it core to business success. And I really believe that environmental and social issues are, are what are gonna make our businesses competitive in the future. There's no question. It's the, the paradigm of trade-offs, we all know that. That's, that's God. And, and the future is about businesses that get it. So in the few minutes I have left before I open it up to, to hear from you, um, I wanna look ahead. I wanna say, okay, here's these lessons. They're rather abstract, but what is the system that we're gonna build look like? Um, for the building Internet of Things, uh, we need to know where our buildings are. That sounds easy and obvious, and yet <laughs> it's a huge challenge. Um, and not only do we need to know where they are spatially, we need to know where they are temporally, right? Because buildings are a timeline of events. Um, we need to know um, who's involved in them, the demographic data. Um, that allows us to have um, an understanding of the ethics, of the demographics, of um, the context. Um, the performance data feeds are gonna give us our building metrics, and the base coverages are really how we understand the world, the, the map on which it sits. And from that, I told you that we need to serve multiple constituencies. We're gonna build interfaces for architects and engineers, for facility managers, for government, for owners, for occupants, and for the investor community as we've started with GRAS. And what is this gonna do? Well, in the abstract, it's gonna take data and make variables out of it and benchmark those variables as indicators, as LEED and other systems have done. But from that, we're gonna create goals. And with those goals, we're gonna have strategies for change. So really, this isn't about a rating system. This is about our goals and our strategies for success. And so we, we grind, we grind, we ground this work in um, social science theory, and we look at the action research cycle and we say, okay, you're gonna observe using the building internet of thing, you're gonna reflect on those observations, you're gonna write your plan for change, and then you're gonna, you're gonna act on that, and then you're gonna observe the effect. And from that second observation, you're gonna learn going to reflect, you're going to revise your plan, and you're going to re-implement. So basically, you're driving a car of sorts, but you're driving it through a sequence of changes. Um, and those changes are going to give us feedback as we go. Um, what's really complicated about this is that's all happening in multiple concurrent cycles from multiple data feeds. So it gets a little abstract, but basically, um, I'm tr I'm, it isn't just one plan. It's every change I make in my organization, in my building, um, in my system, is gonna change the data, which is then going to adjust my plan. And that's the way we drive organizations towards improvement. So how does this have a consciousness towards the better planet we're trying to create? Well, that's where things like LEAD come in. LEAD provides benchmark metrics so we know where we sit now and then where we want to go in the future. And also, 
off that fingerprint that the, the measurements of our rating system show us, we're going to turn to other similar situations occurring around the world, our neighbors, our peers, our, uh, what, what have others done in the same situation to improve, right? And so, so you use processes to, to, to model what you're going to do based on what the success and failures of others have been in the same situation. And then what do the experts think, right? That, that it's not just what's popular or what's been done, but it's also what is expert opinion. So it's a combination of benchmarks and indicators, popularity, if you will, like what else is being done, and expert opinion that allows us to make a much more simple improvement system, to make a um, system that isn't just awash with data, but instead is driving us towards very specific recommendations about what we should do based on the data that's come in. And what's so important is that the outcomes of those changes we make have to be measured and then feed back into the system. That's what makes it a learning machine. So if we can capture the outcome from the change we've made, that's how we're building a system that allows, uh, that, that allows for improvement. So kind of an abstract concept, but I think, you know, thinking about the work that Gresb has done, that Lucid has done, um, and that you're doing, um, we, we have to ground these recommendation systems as an abstraction into practical, concrete applications of technology. So we've tried to give you a building Internet of Things presentation that's, that's that's not about the, the, you know, the connected device, that's really about the vision and about the evolution in the past, the promise of today, and then a vision for recommendation systems and machine learning in the future. Thanks. <laughs>And so um, what we're going to do is, um, because it's being recorded, um, if you, you know, use the microphone for any questions or comments or observations that you have, I um, want to open it up. No reaction? <laughs> ah. Sure. Uh, collecting all this data presupposes there's reliability that you can believe the data mm -hmm. and the transmission of that has to be reliable. Do you have any comments on transferring the control of the internet to uh, the other side of the world? I'm happy to uh, speak, speak to that. That's actually a very good question. I think when we use terms to describe uh, business grade data or investment grade mm -hmm. data, that's really what we mean. There is a big gap between the data you have in your systems and where it needs to be in order for it to be useful for making operational decisions. And, and generally speaking, I think building data is written with data quality problems across the board. Uh, they need to be accounted for. There's gaps, there's spikes, there's outages of devices. And so that's one very big thing that we as a company have to deal with is what are the strategies and algorithms to detect outages, to alert users so you can bring devices back online. How do you fill the gaps? Um, there's um, no standards body that has written the book and the standards on how you should handle with those things. Um, that's something that uh, we have an effort uh, on. Um, it's something that the utility industry has addressed because they have a lot of also gaps in their data, believe it or not. Um, they have struggled with the same challenges, and, but they have to cut a build that's accurate. So there's actually developed methodologies for how you uh, account for those things, and we have sort of dedicated data quality engines that uh, create that so when we serve up data a platform like Gresp, it's something that investors can really trust, has been vetted, and if someone does any kind of edits or audits to the data, all that's carefully recorded for reconciliation purposes. Yeah, if I may add to that. Uh, so, you know, Vladi, you described very nicely of, of what you do in, in, in your system, on, if you want to, on the building level to, uh, to ensure the integrity of the data. From our perspective, as we feed this to financial markets, and you know, it's used for financial decisions, what we're very interested in is that this data flows automatically by our APIs. So APIs provide a very neat tool, a very easy tool to just 
dock all of these software systems into each other. It's from a technical perspective almost trivial now. Um, and additional to that automatic flow, we're also very interested in an audible trail. So for us, it's very cool to know, OK, this is a recording by the meter. And it flowed from there to there. And then it was aggregated by Vladi systems in this and this way. Following values have been corrected or predictions have been made. And then it went through, let's say, one or two other stages, essentially, in our assessment. And not that we ever would get the idea to follow the trail of all of these information points. It's very important that the users of these systems know that this trail exists. So if somebody gets the idea to tweak data or tune it um, and to essentially report to investors uh, you know, non-real performance, uh, we know on our side that we can prove that if it happens so people don't take the risk. So this auditability of data flow is crucial for us. So the, this, I'm going to give you a third perspective, and it's a little heretical as, a, as an IT person, but I'm <laughs> going to do it anyway. It's a good question. Um, for me, a couple of things. One, um, often it's the relative measurement that's important in my perspective. It's, it's what is the absolute truth that may be less important than did the change that I do result in a, in a positive trend in, the, in these data. And the second thing I would say that, that again comes from work often in other fields is that these data are an excuse to get the right people working on the right problem together. So that you know, it, it can often be less about the accuracy and validity uh, of the measure, even though you know, from an investor perspective, it's investor grade data, I'm, I, I'm not speaking to that. What I'm speaking to is that um, it's about the process more than the measurement. Excellent. Uh, yeah, um, I guess, uh, well, first of all, with regard to this last question, uh, how can you be, um, I guess, how can you be, uh, like as one company, say, managing uh, trillions of dollars worth of property, uh, certainly um, you become a kind of target for corruption. Though. You know, I mean, you're talking about the relationship between the data and investment. I mean, it seems... Uh, anyways, I mean, it seems curious to be sort of um, kind of overly optimistic that that wouldn't be uh, like possibly corrupted in some way. But, um, but I, I guess I'm more curious about, you talked a lot about metrics and measurements, but you didn't talk about how this relates to the kind of qualitative experience, like from a kind of sustainability perspective, you know, actually relates to people and not systems and money. Well, I think the... Uh, happy to take a response on that. So we spend a lot of time working with people because our company got founded on the basis of occupant engagement. How do you take technical data and apply it to a uh, non-technical audience and get the occupants of the building to you know, play their part in um, energy managers, building managers uh, to some degree. Um, and so there is a big element of that. Um, ultimately, the tool, and that's what we realized early on, that's why we became a data company, the tool is data and making that very easy. Um, it's the sustainability practitioner's job to engage people. Frankly, in most organizations, it is a sustainability practitioner who's in charge of all that. So that comes down to marketing and communication. It comes down to marketing and communication down to the tenants and down to the uh, employees and the students, depending on the use case, and also up to uh, the world or up to investors, depending, again, on the market and the use cases. So that, that's the critical role, I think, that we all play as sustainability practitioners in being that marketing communication vehicle, but we need the hard data and the metrics to do that because we got to celebrate success and we also have to make sure that uh, issues are very clearly visible to everyone. Yeah, hi, Chris from AMP Capital in Australia. Hi. Um, we've, we've tried some of this um, big data analytics uh, on our building management systems and one of the interesting problems we encountered was the naming conventions for the building management system. So once you're exporting all the data from your building management system into a cloud computing software and doing machine learning analytics to try and figure out what you can optimize, the issue becomes, well, say a building has 13,000 data points, which was one of our buildings, the, the analytics engine could recognize automatically about 2,000 of them, and the rest was, now we have to manually go through and figure out what each data point is because Every BMS manufacturer has a different naming convention. They don't like using Haystack, which is the common international convention. So I think 
the big problem that we've found has been around those common protocols. Like there is no backnet you know, equivalent. So there's still, I think, a lot of evolution to go around naming conventions, around how do we make sure these um, data points are all consistently understood so that they can roll up and be aggregated and, and be analyzed properly. So maybe if you, the panel could just talk a little bit about the progress in terms of those protocols and making sure that the data is consistent and comparable and understandable at once it becomes aggregated. You want to take it on the building level? Yeah. Afterwards? Yeah, that, that's how the data flows. So yeah, yeah, that exactly. makes sense. That's, uh, there. Um, I said earlier that we stand on the shoulder of giants when it comes to technology, uh, but we've also inherited an enormous amount of technical debt uh, from uh, technology developments mm -hmm. past. Um, we still use the backend protocol. The backend protocol is not an adequate solution to the technology needs that we have today. We need a new standard. We need a new standard that describes the entire building data model uh, with all the systems, with all the tagging, mm -hmm. with all the properties. And I think when you talk about technology integrations between any company that works in the space uh, and ultimately the building owner, the challenge we face is that central data model does not exist. People have worked on the periphery of it, um, depending on the use case. You know, uh, fault detection analytics, as far as asset level analytics goes, that's the biggest challenge. And that's, that is the biggest barrier, is that tagging exercise. It's massive. It's a major, major challenge. Um, and the only solution to it, we don't have a solution for it. Uh, you know, Haystack is kind of a, you know, a Band-Aid solution to basically make it better. But the core issue that needs to be addressed is new standards. We need to develop new standards that streamline um, the nomenclature of uh, building definitions and the, the kind of the, the standard building data model. Um, if I may add to that, once the data, let's say, that problem is solved on the building level and it comes really to the question of, you know, how, for example, does Lucid Systems speak to us, or how do other systems speak to Energy Star in an automatic way? Uh, I find it very encouraging that different governments realize this and try to do something about it. For example, in the United States, you have the BEADS initiatives. This is from the Department of Energy. Uh, really, this effort to, you know, in a standardized way, put out a dictionary uh, in what certain variables need, means. So what that specifically means for us, for example, if we ask for certain variables, BEADS went, or the DOE, went through our data structure and said, okay, with this variable, GRESP is actually talking about this and this data point. And that's at best, you know, at the beginning of the process. Uh, however, what I think about this is that it's impossible to be prescriptive on this. It's not going to be the case that, let's say, the Department of Energy is going to say, okay, all variables are going to be called this in this way when they talk about following things. So it's about slow reconcilia reconciliation uh, where, uh, you know, definitions are just set up and there is an increasing talk about, okay, what do you mean and what's this variable? And as all of these systems connect via APIs, we actually have a huge interest in it. For us, it's one of the most difficult and expensive parts to deal with is that our systems name their variables different than we do. And for them, it's a pain in the ass as well. So over time, I think this will you know, get better and better and better as it's in everybody's interest. But it's a symptom of a problem. Um, and the problem, I think, is that um, there was an opportunity 10 or 15 years ago to make this problem go away for us, and, and nobody took it, if you will. Yeah. I think our government in particular wasn't interested, right? And, and so we've, you know, when I talk about how successful this movement has been in, in the absence of government support, we don't know how to define space type. We don't know how to define uh, square footage. Um, we don't know how to locate our buildings, and we don't have a unique identifier, let alone the thousands of fields that you're talking about. Um, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's created a lot. We've now inherited a problem. You know, look at the GIS industry, where our government went and digitized all our whole road network, and an entire industry emerged. Right? It's the, it's a, it's a place where the market didn't solve the problem, so the problem didn't get solved. Um, and eventually, the market will solve it. But it's, it's. You know, we've inherited the legacy of, of you know, a government that didn't step in, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, Hi, my name is uh, Ani Devdar from Arm um, Technologies. Um, I would love for the panel to uh, double click on the IoT part of the uh, title and um, maybe uh, pause it on some of the use cases you have seen on things like sensors and machine learning and blockchain and AI 
that we hear so often in the IoT world. And I would love to hear what you are seeing in the building space uh, for these themes. So we'll follow the data again. Um, generally seeing the big transition that we're seeing is that uh, device manufacturers, they make a sensing device or an actuator, a sort of bypassing these old protocols, the legacy protocols, BACnet, Modbus, and so forth, uh, where you, which were never designed for the internet. They were designed for the intranet inside of the building. Um, and so they're kind of, uh, you're going directly device to cloud. So that's the biggest difference is that you now have a device that doesn't need a building IoT gateway like a 3 MJs or an obvious aqua suite or some of those devices that allow us to get older devices online. And you can go directly to the cloud. Now the challenges with that, which companies are now beginning to solve, um, and that's where a lot of the really uh, device companies are focused on, uh, have to do with the security, with the device management. Uh, you're now deploying an IT asset. What used to be an operations asset is now purely an IT asset, and we have to learn how to live in an IT world and play nice with IT professionals. And that's, that's been a learning curve for the industry. So um, it's going to take time, but you know, there's a lot of momentum and there's a lot of innovation in that aspect. So I think we're making great progress of getting uh, data from devices to the cloud. And, and now where we're really focused, that's gotten pretty easy and the costs have really come down a lot. Where now we're focused around more is how do we make that onboarding process, how do we make working with data easy so that asking, we don't want to ask data questions, we want to ask business questions. So we want to make sure that asking business questions is, is straightforward and simple. Nothing to add. Yeah, I don't <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was an excellent answer. Do we have time for one more? Or this is it. All right. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.